Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome back to the AABSO How-To Webinar Series. It's really great to see all of you here today. We have two exciting speakers lined up for you today, but before we get started, I do have a couple of quick announcements to make. First of all, we are running Zoom in webinar mode today. You've probably heard this a hundred times before, but uh, webinar mode does come with a few special features that you get to access. Uh, first of all, there's the Q&A button. You can find that down at the bottom of your screen. If you click on the Q&A button, then you can type in questions for our speakers, and I highly recommend that you do just that. Uh, note that since we do have multiple speakers today, if your question is intended for one particular speaker, you want to make sure you include their name when you ask your question. Another feature, which you can find out there at the bottom of your screen, is a button labeled CC, or closed captions. Uh, when you click on that CC, or show captions button, you can enable or disable Zoom's automatic closed captioning. Good one to have in your toolkit. Next, I'd like to give a shout out to our other monthly webinar series, which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. It's entirely in Spanish, including the title, which translates to The Science of the Sky for Beginners. Each webinar introduces basic science and astronomy concepts and provides opportunities for casual discussions between presenters and participants. It's totally free and aimed at the general public, age 12 and up. The next broadcast is scheduled for May 20th, and the series will continue to air on the third Saturday of each month all throughout 2023. Please feel free to spread the word to your Spanish-speaking friends and colleagues. And now, back to the webinar at hand. Our 2023 how-to series is sponsored in full by Boyce Astro. We'd like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge them for their generous support. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AABSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. All right, now let me go ahead and close my screen share out here. Our first instructor for today holds a PhD in satellite communications from the University of Bristol, and he spent most of his career in the telecommunications industry, helping to design and build mobile, te uh, mobile telephone networks. He started out in astronomy about four years ago as a visual observer with a secondhand eight inch Dobsonian. And from there, he quickly moved up to electronically assisted oh. astronomy or EAA. Finally, he took an exoplanet course and decided to focus on photometry. Very wise decision. <laughs> Today, he teaches CMOS photometry as a mentor in the AADSO's mentorship program, and he's also a member of the San Diego Astronomy Association. Last year, he used his photometry expertise to run a super cool variable star photometry demonstration at the SDAA's Julian Starfest event. Today, he's joining us to share with us exactly how he put on that demonstration, and maybe even share some tips which you yourself can go out and apply to your own outreach. Now, if you're anything like me, then I imagine you're very eager to hear what he has to say. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce Gary Hawkins. Welcome, Gary. Uh, thanks, Lauren, for that introduction. Uh, let me do my screen share here, and hopefully we can get up and running. Okay, right. Um, well, thanks for everybody who's joining today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and talking to you. Uh, I've got about a 20 minute presentation and uh, if you can put your questions in the Q&A, that would be great. And myself and Patrick will uh, answer those questions um, at the end. I've got quite a few slides today, which I'm gonna skip through fairly quickly. Um, and uh, if you want more detailed responses, then obviously Q&A is the time to do that. Um, so I um, live in East County, um, just to the east of San Diego. Um, I have an observatory, uh, well, sort of, called the Blossom Valley Small Telescope Observatory for reasons you'll see in a few moments. I am a member of the AAVSO and the San Diego Astronomy Association. Uh, Lauren did a great job there of introducing me, so <clears throat> I'm not going to go through that again, except for to say that as an AAVSO mentor, I currently have uh, 10 students um, 
if any of you are interested in going into the mentorship program, I can thoroughly recommend it. I, although I'm a mentor myself, I also have a mentor uh, that um, I am in frequent contact with, and it's a great resource if you are an AAVSO member. The one group that um, Lauren didn't mention is I'm also a member of the Red Wolf group. Um, and I will talk about that more in a few moments. And uh, if you're interested, I have a YouTube channel where I have a number of videos on EAA and photometry. Um, and the link to that is at the bottom of this slide. So why should you be doing real-time photometry? Um, there are three really good reasons to do real-time photometry. Uh, and the first is kind of the topic of this talk. And that offers, it brings a different perspective to the way that you can do public outreach. Um, you know, we, I'm sure you've all been to outreach events or participated in them. And it's usually the visual or EAA side that people are concentrating on. Um, the science side of it, while people obviously talk about the science during a, a public outreach event, it's difficult to show. Well, it actually isn't. Um, it's fairly straightforward to demonstrate real-time photometry. Um, and I'll go into that in a few moments and share some of those experiences with you. Uh, real-time photometry is also extremely useful in allowing you to monitor an ongoing photometry session. Um, rather than collecting all your data um, and then probably the next day post-processing that data and finding out the results you've got, um, doing real-time photometry, viewing the results as they come in, gives you a lot of insight into what's going on and it allows you to address problems as they're coming up. And finally, it really does kind of add a new level of experience excitement to your photometric observing. And I'll talk to that in the final part of this presentation. So um, at the uh, BVSTO, um, we have a pretty modest facility. This is the main telescope. Um, it's um, a fairly old Celestron CA SCT on a EQ6R Pro mount. I have a focal reducer in the uh, in the optical uh, path, and the camera is an a ZWA ASI 533MC. Uh, for a photometrist, I guess I'm fairly unusual in so much as I actually use a color tri a tricolor camera. So I'm producing a tricolor results, so TR, TG, TB results. And these are either submitted to databases in that form or transformed, uh, transformed into the equivalent Johnson & Cousin values. Um, because the ZWO camera that I use has a fairly significant near IR response in all three channels, I also have a UV IR cut filter in the optical chain to make sure that um, um, the response is constrained to the visual range between 400 and 700 nanometers. Uh, you will have noticed a guide scope on the camera. This is useful, obviously, for photometry for doing longer exposures. There is a tail rad there as well, but to be perfectly honest, all of my target location is done by plate solving these days. And uh, uh, it's all run from an i5 uh, laptop. On the software side, I use SharpCap Pro as the data capture software, Part to Seal um, as the uh, sky mapping software, PhD2 for guiding, and importantly, from the perspective of doing real-time photometry, I use Astro Image J, and I'll give you some more information on, on that in a few moments. Uh, all of these packages are basically free or um, um, in fact, the only one that's really paid is SharpCat Pro, uh, and that's a very modest price per year. There's a lot of really good open source software out there that I would thoroughly recommend that people use if they're if they want to set up their equipment on a on a budget. So AIJ and doing real time photometry with AIJ. I'm not too sure how many of you are familiar with AIJ, but it's one of a number of differential photometry 
post-processing tools is certainly my tool of choice. Um, I've looked at a couple of other tools, including ASTAP um, and AIP4Win, uh, but AIJ is definitely my tool of choice. Um, it's under active development um, by a group led by Karen Collins um, at Lu Louisville um, University. It also has a very well supported uh, user forum where you can seek answers uh, both from Karen herself um, and also from the extensive user base um, of AIJ. Now, some people do say that this can be a little overwhelming as a program to start with, but I can certainly tell you it's well worth the time to learn. So if you're looking for a differential photometry tool, um, give AIJ a, a look and I don't think you'll be disappointed. AIJ is very popular in the exoplanet community. Um, it has a lot of additional features that are specific um, to exoplanets, but actually you can use some of those features for regular photometry as well. And so again, there's some cool stuff in there that allows you to do graphing and trending and fitting and, and stuff like that. I've put a link on the slide if you wanna go out and take a look at the AIJ webpage. And everything that I talk about today, which I'm going to skip over fairly um, in fairly quick order, but I have a paper uh, that was in the AAVSO 111th conference proceedings, um, page 75, called "Demonstrating Real-Time Photometry." This um, paper is based on a poster that was actually given at the um, conference and it gives you all the details that I'm gonna go over. So if you go and do a quick Google search um, and get the conference proceedings, uh, then you, you can get even more detail in a, in a fully written paper. So if we're using AIJ, and obviously I haven't got time today to go through the basics of AIJ, um, but if you're using AIJ, the place to start with doing real-time photometry is something called the DP or data processor. If you click on that button, which is circled on the, uh, the toolbar that you'll see when you initially bring up AIJ, it's going to launch a couple of windows for you. And the first one of those windows is called the DP coordinate converter. And this is simply a place where you input your target and you also uh, put in the location of your observatory and information like that. And it sets up all the appropriate parameters for calculating uh, appropriate time stamps and also air mass, et cetera, et cetera. The second window that pops up, and this is kind of the key window here for doing real-time photometry, is the CCD data processor window. And what you'll find here is there's actually a way to do folder polling. So basically, SharpCat will drop raw fits images into a designated folder, and then I can command AIJ to go look at that folder on a regular basis and uh, poll that folder. And as each one of the new images comes in, uh, that image is processed and the results are displayed in real time. So the blue oval uh, shows you um, an example of setting up a folder. Uh, you use wildcards in order to make sure that you pull in all the, the files that you need with the appropriate name as they get dropped into that folder. Um, and then you also make sure that you've set the checkboxes uh, in the green circle. And this basically allows for the automatic updating um, or post-processing, I should say, of the uh, results as they come in. And you set the polling in intervals to something other than zero. So in this case, I poll every second, and it just keeps looking in this folder for new files. And as each one of them comes in, it processes, uh, does the differential photometry according to the aperture placement. And the next screen that will come up is indeed the aperture placement control window. A um, couple of things to note here. I like to use um, the auto variable aperture um, setting. 
This allows the uh, apertures to change frame by frame if necessary. And the reason I like to use this is because it's a good way of dealing with uh, if the seeing conditions are changing. If, for instance, you get some high level cloud drift through, the star is going to get a bit more blurred and spread out. And so having something like a variable aperture is, is useful uh, in so much as it deals with that. Um, in the yellow, box the important checks check mark is particularly the centroid apertures uh check box and essentially what this means is that once you've placed an aperture uh it will move that aperture across the field of view as the star might drift across that field of view and even with guiding you're going to find there's some star drift um and that needs to be accounted for and so therefore having the centroid aperture um, checkbox checked allows that aperture to follow the, the target in the comp stars. Uh, the one thing this does mean is that when you get to the uh, a meridian flip, um, things are gonna fall apart at this point. So uh, typically if you're doing a long run and you wanna look at uh, the real-time photometry on both sides of the meridian, this is the point where you would stop the program restart it again, select new apertures, et cetera, et cetera. And the green box, the check box that's important here is to make sure that you update the measurements table and the plot while the program's running and doing its polling. And if you do all of that, you can then start real-time photometry. And so the first time I tried this, as Lauren mentioned, was at the Julian Starfest in uh, 2022. Uh, Julian, California is about 25 miles away from us. It's a good dark sky site. And the Starfest is well attended by amateur astronomers and the public alike. Um, an ideal target for doing uh, real-time photometry is an eclipsing binary. Pick an eclipsing binary that has a reasonable magnitude change and a relatively short period in which um, the two stars rotate around each other. Um, the star that I chose for this particular demonstration was V796 SEP. Um, I believe the rotational period from memory was about nine hours. And as you can see from the uh, bottom right hand graph, the, um, the eclipsing, uh, the change in the light curve is very apparent for the eclipsing binary target compared to the two comp stars that I chose for that evening. Now, this image is a little noisy. Um, conditions were not ideal during this Julian Starfest. We had some high level cloud, um, but again, um, it's easy to see what's taking place here and the fact that you're looking at something different. And I guess much to my surprise, the, um, the public was actually really fascinated by what was going on here. Um, uh, the concept of an eclipsing binary, I don't think many people have heard of, uh, but when it was explained to them, it was kind of um, apparent what might occur. And the fact that you could actually see that developing in real time uh, really sort of captivated them. And it was great to be able to show something completely different. I was actually next to um, a co an SDAA colleague, um, Woody Shum, who runs a, a big uh, EAA mobile observatory. And he was doing some great deep sky imaging for the public. So to be able to show something completely different next to them was uh, kind of fascinating. And I basically encourage people to come back during the evening and see the progress of the event. And in fact, many people did that. They, they came across two or three times during the evening and, and saw the developing light curve in real time. And, and they could obviously see what was going on. Um, I think it's very useful when you're doing this type of public outreach to have a support presentation so that you can actually explain to the public what's going on in terms of what an eclipsing binary is and how the light curve might be affected and why we do these type of measurements, et cetera, et cetera. So I had a, a 14 or 15 slide PowerPoint, um, PowerPoint available that I could just cut backwards and forwards between during the night and um, you know, go through that to the public that we're viewing at any given time. Um, and 
I think the other thing that the public was really interested to hear about and actually quite excited was the fact that amateur astronomers can support professional science in terms of photometry and stuff like that. And so my presentation also touched on the alert notices coming out of the AAVSO and other similar organizations and some of the professional amateur collaboration that's taking place, um, particularly for supporting some of the well-known telescopes like Hubble and uh, James Webb. So the second area where I mentioned uh, that real-time photometry can come in really useful is in the monitoring of an ongoing um, photometric uh, measurement, or in this case, um, a spectroscopy time series measurement, uh, which was being undertaken by the telescope on the right-hand side. And I believe Dave Decker, one of my SVA a colleagues is online listening to this presentation. That's Dave Scope. Uh, he's uh, very much into spectroscopy. Um, and that's my scope on the left hand side. And actually, what we're doing here is my scope is looking at the same target star. Um, and I'm viewing this so that we can make sure that what's being viewed by the spectroscope. Uh, the spectroscopic side of this is the the valid the data is valid because often you know and I'm sure you've probably appreciated this in your own observing you know you'll get thin high level cloud float through um, your field of view and you often won't really know it's there um, and if you look at differential photometry results because differential photometry is actually quite good for correcting those things again you won't really appreciate the fact that high level cloud is going across your target. Now, if you're doing spectroscopic measurements, that cloud can be a problem because now it's reflecting light uh, back to the telescope along with the target star. And that can actually make a difference to uh, what you're seeing from a uh, spectral perspective. And, and you need to know that's taking place. And within AIJ, what I do is I plot, instead of plotting the relative flux, which is essentially the flux of the target star compared to the flux of the comparison stars, I will plot the source minus sky just for the target star when I'm trying to do a monitoring exercise like this. And so now you're not implementing differential photometry, you're just looking at straight photometry. And you're, all you're doing is basically taking the flux coming in from the uh, target and removing the sky noise or what you believe is the sky noise. And that tells you a lot about what's going on that's going to be lost if you just look at the differential photometry results. And this is a great illustration of what we saw that evening. So this is my different. Uh, this is my photometry results for that evening. Um, we were looking at the uh, an M class star HD uh, 95735, uh, and I'm not sure if my cursor is showing up on the screen, but if it's not, I'll just kind of describe things as well. Um, had this been a perfectly clear evening, we would have seen a, a source minus sky um, result. It's been normalized. Um, that would slowly show a decreasing flux as the air mass, which is shown by the solid dark line, increased. Um, and everything would be fine. Um, the spectroscopic measurements would, if, if that had just been the case, the spectroscopic measurements would have been fine. Um, and the results that we were seeing from the spectroscope would be just the target star. But that wasn't happening this evening. Um, we had high thin clouds going across for the first part of the evening. And then you can see that once we get past about 0 0.71, those high clouds become um, started to pass across the target star. And we started to see a flux drop in the star of up to 30%. And then the clouds went away for a while and we got a nice stable region again. And then all of a sudden we started to see much denser cloud. In this cloud, you could actually see this was producing nearly an 80% drop in the flux level. Um, 
And then things kind of returned to normal again. And then towards the end of the evening, we got into that high drifting cloud again, and eventually it got worse and we kind of gave up the session. And why this again is useful just to drive home this point is that in these periods, the, the, the first period of the 30% drop and then the really deep drop and then the final period, you've got to be careful about interpreting the results that you're getting from the spectroscopic side. Because, um, that is going to be uh, potentially an issue because you're now not only looking at um, the flux coming from the target star, but you're also going to be getting reflection off of that high level cloud. So um, another thing I'm going to mention here at this point is my involvement in the Red Dwarf Group. Um, the Red Dwarf Group was created in 2021, and I believe Bob, who is the main driving force behind it, is online today. So hi, Bob. Um, and the goal of the Red Dwarf Group is to observe stellar flares and characterize their spectroscopic properties, so variations in strength, uh, line strength and, and profile versus time, and their photometric properties, so basically flux against time. Um, the group does this uh, through a collaboration of about 30 amateurs worldwide, um, and it times its measurements to coincide with coverage by the test satellite. And so most of the time we're observing stars that have also, are also being observed by tests simultaneously in the near IR. Um, and after the group was created, after a, a while, um, it became both a professional amateur collaboration um, as James Jackman, who's a postdoctoral research scholar um, at ASU joined the group as well. So we have a group of about 31 or so individuals. Uh, we meet on a, a bi-weekly uh, schedule to discuss what's going on and where we should be focusing our efforts and looking at some of the latest results and stuff like that. And, and we're doing this because these M-class stars are, are very um, numerous uh, in, the, in the Milky Way. Um, they also typically have a number of planets orbiting them. And because of their type, they're very active from a, they rotate quickly, they've got strong magnetic fields. And what this means to say is that they generate some fairly big stellar flares. And what we're trying to do is, is look at those stellar flares, characterize them, work out what frequencies they're coming at you know with with the class of star etc cetera, etc cetera. and the ultimate goal of this is to obviously then determine how these stellar flares could either affect the evolution of life on the planets in you know what's typically called the goldilocks zone or the destruction of those same planets so it's kind of been a fascinating project um i joined it about a year ago fortunately an sdaa colleague of mine um, alerted me to it, and it's been a great way to focus my observing, and now I'm getting very much into the sort of scientific side of this and beginning to write papers around it, so it's been a, it's been a great thing for me. If you're interested in learning more about the Red Dwarf Group, there's a link on this slide, and again, the reason I mention it kind of flows into the next slide. Well, hopefully that isn't too loud. And hopefully you recognize it. Um, it's obviously that very, um, well, the picture is Dr. Haraway, the movie is Contact. And I don't know if you're like me, but I'm kind of a space buff. So, you know, this was a great movie for me. And I remember watching this the first time and um, it was kind of cool, right? That, that thumping of the incoming transmission from outer space. Um, and the reason I mention that is because it's not often that you hear the words excitement and photometry in the same sentence. <laughs> you know, most of us uh, have the equipment running for seven, six, seven hours a night. We wake up in the morning, we've got gigabytes of data on the hard drive, it's then post-processed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not super exciting. Um, I mean, seeing some good results is exciting, but you know, it's not instantaneously exciting. Well, real-time real photometry changes that. 
Um, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, if you are viewing a transient stellar flare in real time, particularly for the first time, it will make the hairs on your arm stand erect. Um, it's just a thrilling experience. Um, uh, we were sitting in our living room and I say we, so that was my wife and my eight-year-old who's actually sitting on the floor listening to the presentation. Uh, she's the youngest member of the SDAA. So I'll give a shout out to Joy. Hi, Joy. And um, she, um, we were all sitting there uh, watching a movie. We had, uh, I, I used Teleview to bring my um, uh, screen share into the, the room. So we had the computer sitting on the coffee table in front of us watching a movie. And then all of a sudden we see the leading edge of this flare uh, that you see in the, in, the, uh, in the diagram at the bottom. And it was pretty, uh, pretty exciting. I mean, this was the first stellar flare I'd ever seen. Uh, and luckily enough, it was both a big flare and it was also a double flare event. So, um, you know, if you want to make your photometry exciting, particularly if you're looking at transient events rather than ones that you know are going to happen, uh, this is a great way of doing it by adding that real-time photometry to your work. And just a final plug, I, I, and I, again, I must say, if you can get yourself into a professional amateur collaboration like the RDG, as a photometrist, this has been incredible. It's, it's brought, it's given me access, access to some wonderful people to talk to, way brighter than I am. And um, it allows you to get into a program and have structure to what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. So if you've heard of NASA's Exoplanet Watch or you wanna join the RDG or you, any one of the other collaborations that are taking place out there, uh, I would thoroughly recommend you take a look at it. So that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation. So just in summary, I'll say, um, the ability to undertake real-time photometry brings a whole new dimension to your photometry um, um, journey, uh, both as an observer and also for doing public outreach. So I would thoroughly recommend that you take a look at it and see how it's easy it is. Um, any differential photometry tool that supports folder polling um, should be able to provide you. I did a quick search on chat GPT. Uh, which I'm also happy to take questions on at the end of this if you want my opinion of how chat GPT is going to affect astronomy. Um, according to chat GPT, most of the differential photometry tools out there, including MaximDL, AP4Win, Iris, Photometrica. I know um, I got a message from somebody the other day at, um, saying that they were going to contact um, the developer of ASTAP to make sure that this is available. Most of those tools should be able to support real-time photometry. So if they do and you're using them, take a look. And like I said, once again, if you wanna make your photometry exciting when you're looking at transient events, there's nothing like doing it with real-time photometry. Okay, well, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and I look forward to answering any questions you have at the end. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gary. That was a wonderful presentation. And we have had some great questions come in so far. I just want to let everyone know uh, we are going to get to your questions in the group Q&A at the end. But uh, first, we're going to go to Patrick's presentation. So let's go ahead and do the introduction. So our next speaker is an active member in the Centro Astronomico Clavius in Mexico. Uh, he can correct my pronunciation on that. <laughs> um, and he has training in both astrophotography and photometry. He joined the AAVSO about three years ago, and after some time practicing low resolution diffraction grading spectroscopy, he helped us to put on the 2020 AAVSO spectroscopy workshop. Last year, he founded his own club, the Copernicus Club, where he gives weekly talks to teach others about astronomy. Through the Copernicus Club, he designed and instructed his own two-month-long course all about spectroscopy as a way of introducing his local community to the wonders of stellar science. It sounds like it was a really cool program, and I think if you're at all interested in doing spectroscopy-related outreach, uh, you're going to be very interested in hearing what he has to say about this. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Patrick Cavanaugh.
Great to have you, Patrick. Patrick, I think uh, you're Patrick. muted. Uh, uh, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction, and uh, thank everyone here for, for being here. Uh, and uh, my name is Patrick, and uh, uh, thank you for joining us. And this brings me to a question. Why are we here, or why are you here? Think about that a minute. It's a valid question. I think there's two answers here, spectroscopy, and outreach? The answer is you and I are in the same boat and we're in, we love spectroscopy. We see its potential. We want to learn more on the one hand and what it, we want to share it with others because it's, we think it's beautiful and we think it's relevant. Talking about things that are beautiful, talking about things that are relevant. Um, let me go one step ahead. This was last month, looking out on the Pacific Ocean down here in Mexico. Is there anything as beautiful as this? As breathtaking, taking? It's always different. I come out on the uh, terrace every morning and look at it. And uh, I come out at night also because the uh, sky is a book and it's full of great stories. The Greeks understood this much better than most people. They filled it through with their entire myth mythology. They even linked with lines, imaginary lines, all the different stars and groups, starting what we call constellations. But you know, if you want to enjoy a book, you just can't just look at the pictures. You have to learn the language. You have to connect the letters and form words. You have to find meaning. And spectroscopy teaches us how to read the stars their temperature, their character, or if they're coming, or if they're going. So one spectrum of light at so many different wavelengths. Now, from here, I'm gonna share a story, a personal story of my life, the last 12 months, what's happened to us. Well, Stella and I, we've been married for 45 years and a wonderful Mexican lady. And we go to mass every Sunday. And usually uh, we mass is over, we go running out like a stampede. And uh, we stayed there a while. And he says, why don't we talk to the, the parish uh, pastor? And we talked to him and he says, hey, Father, what would you think if we started an astronomy club here, the atrium? Uh, father immediately answered, that's a great idea. Uh, the sky is interesting for all of us. Uh, we organized a talk every Monday at 6.30. We started talking about constellations, planets, the NASA, the moon. We started to put uh, print up posters, uh, sign up people. We designed a, a program, printed it. And eventually we even stood up on in front of the church after every mass. And what we would do is uh, tell people, well, we've got a meeting tomorrow, Monday. And we, we even enrolled our club in the NASA Observe the Moon Night. And so there it is. The, uh, the, the, uh, the, the little arrow points to the, uh, the place where our church atrium is. Um, and then, you summon them and they come. And they come enthusiastically. And this was uh, people coming out of uh, Saturday evening mass. So they came. And one of the courses we designed, as uh, Lauren said, was about spectroscopy. And uh, it, it, we had young people, 
Uh, we had people in 19, 20 years old, college kids. And we had one lady who is, she might be lying about her age, but I think she's in her mid nineties. So we got a good uh, spread there. Uh, and I told him, I want you to become intimate with the stars. I'm, I mean, I just don't want you to know what their names are or what constellation they belong to. It's like being in a party. You just don't want to know people's names. You want to know what they do for a living, what their hobbies are, uh, with, whether they're fast and furious or whatever. But we run into a problem here. Um, because first of all, we have planospheres like this. Uh, we go into charts. And from there, we go look up at the sky. And then in-depth analysis of our experience, we go to outreach and sharing, and then back again, back again to the charts. But then we see the need of how to classify the stars. And this is the, the, the uh, course that uh, we organized for people who, for the most part, had never went to an astron astronomical course. And we talk about the spectral classification and the main sequence and the Hertzsprung Russell uh, diagram, even a little bit misspelled, but nobody really questioned me on that. Uh, and again, here, our first obstacle here was the uh, opinion of this uh, French philosopher at the beginning of uh, last cent of the uh, two centuries ago, who claimed that we would never be capable of determining absolutely the, com the uh, chemical composition of stars or the density or any other real notion on the temperature. These are notions that are forever beyond our comprehension. Well, guess what, August? You got it wrong. Uh, and here we talked about this fascinating young man who was uh, submitted to child labor. He was an orphan at 11, Joseph Van, uh, Van, Van Hofer, who is kind of a hero in Germany. And uh, he was in an accident a factory accident when the factory kiln at the glass factory exploded, went on fire. It was uh, caused a major commotion in the city. And even the famous uh, Maximilian, the Duke, came over in his carriage and tried to help out in the rescue operation and pulled this uh, half living corpse out of the uh, ashes. And he is our hero of the day. And this man, this boy uh, was uh, cared for by the Duke, uh, given books, uh, medicine, uh, got him back on his feet, got a special type of um, schedule, lot works a working spec, uh, schedule that permitted him to work at the factory, at the kiln, and at the same time learn. And uh, this was, uh, a fascinating opportunity for Joseph. Uh, and then eventually his analysis of each one of the batches of glass that he was submitted and he had to analyze, he realized when it was submitted to batch analysis, he always came up with the same prism, but more importantly, with these mysterious hairlines. What were they? Joseph never told us. Joseph never knew. A generation later, Angelo Secchi had, an, had a notion. Uh, Kirchhoff, with the studies and Bunsen, they would tell us this is the chemical print, footprint of what's going on in light, what is going, what is being burnt, what is being, uh, I don't think burnt is, is the right expression transferred, but 
out of this chaos, we need someone to put order in all this information. And there was no group of women, a group of persons better equipped to put things in order than the uh, computer women over at uh, Harvard. And I always insist that there is sort of like a part of our inheritance or heritage at the ABSO come from these women over at Harvard. They put them in order, but I would have said, okay, if I was uh, Edward Pinkerton, I would say, okay, let's put them in alphabetical order. That's easy. Or let's put them in order of magnitude. No, 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 no. Say, no that's not the way to do it. They said, let's put it in, oh, be a good goose. Pick me. The different stars, the different spectral classes. I know this is very basic for the majority of you, but this is the language that I have to speak at for the general public. And then we go and talk about the hydrogen bomber lines, the alpha, the beta, gamma, uh, epsilon, delta, epsilon, and which one, and how they are so noticeable in the class A stars like Sirius uh, or like uh, Vega. Uh, and why are we talking about same atom, but hydrogen, well, what is it? Is it alpha, beta, well, what depends uh, how hot it is, or if it's getting warmer or getting colder. And well, even I'm sure at the time of the computer women, it wasn't very clear what this was, what was going on here. But with Bohr, it came very clear that these would look like a, a popcorn machine. These electrons were popping out of their orbits, going through another orbit, and then coming back. And when they came back, uh, they created the uh, absorption. And when they went out, they created the, uh, the emission. So now I said to my group, let's talk about the, our favorite group, our favorite asterism in Mexico at Christmas time. The three magi, Anitak, Mantika, and Alinam. Uh, Alinam, okay, and Rigol are, are B stars, but Anitak and Mintaka are O stars. What does that mean, O stars? These are the fast and the furious. They're the most exciting ones. Uh, short living, but they really live intensely. Uh, creating a tremendous amount of energy. They're a rare type. And they're right smack in the middle of Orion. So notable, even in these cloudy Mexico City cl clouds, uh, skies. And there, there they are. Anitak, Anitak, Mintaka, and there they are on our typical Richard Walter Spectral Atlas um, diagrams, which we taught them to learn how to interpret and see how absolutely um, exciting it is to see that we can trace what is going on in each one of these fast and furious O-type stars. From so we're talking about stars that are, the light coming out of there came out in the early middle ages and arrived to our telescope or our eyes just last night. What's going to happen to these fast and furious stars? They'll end up being converted into a black hole or possibly into a neutron star. Okay, now we start applying this with uh, our own um, gradings, our own diffraction gradings, and analyzing what we what we pick up, we analyze this with our um, with our uh, software, which 
basically I use RSpec. Uh, and on the one hand, on the left side, we have the spectrum. On the right side, we have the interpretation where we have to determine at any given moment, what is the uh, calibration? In other words, the angstroms per pixel. How many angstroms are we covering in each, in each pixel? Then we interpret it. Right? This was a, a case of Sirius. And I'm here showing how this is so exciting when we start interpreting big events like a supernova. This was something that was discovered, uh, I think his name is Tool, who discovered this supernova um, last sometime last year, 88 million light years ago, in uh, light years away in NCGC 5631. In this picture, you can see that bump on top of the uh, of that galaxy quite clearly. It's amazing how sometimes it's much clearer the supernova than the galaxy itself. And uh, Robin Abeater from uh, England, who is a great supporter of the uh, spectroscopy community over at the BAA, started to analyze this. And it's always very interesting to see the, uh, the emission stars in here. And at the end, and at the almost at the bottom right, the typical titanium oxide W. That is the telltale sign of most supernovas. Uh, and so you get to know what's going on there. I, I tried to interpret it myself and came out with this huge jump in the uh, middle of, from, from obvious uh, uh, the emission uh, light of this supernova. So there's a lot of there's a lot of action going on in that supernova. And okay, a lot of, of us talk or hear so much talking about black holes. Okay. I've never gone out and seen a black hole through my telescope. Okay, but I have seen supernovas. And supernova is the first, that is the the in many cases, the beginning stage of a black hole. So we might not see the black hole because it's black, but we can see the birth of a black hole. Uh, so spectroscopy, this is our group all together at, at the final class. Uh, a wonderful, enthusiastic group of people. Uh, and here we said, knowledge has no limits. Spectroscopy opened me up to a new and an unfaceted astronomy. When we make a, a discovery, always another many more questions suddenly appear. Uh, in our aspect, astronomy, this led on to what we call a taller in Spanish or a workshop. So after we finished the course, we did workshops and we would get together and first of all, make sightings, use a camera. And here I always point out that it's very, very important to make sure that you have that horizontally, that star, Analyzer on the on the top. Here's our star analyzer made in in, uh, in uh, England. And then the second point here is get a camera, a simple DSLR camera. And here with the camera, we see the star analyzer. But this very very important indicator that should always be horizontal out onto the right hand, so that our spectra when we start diagnosing them are gonna be flat and we don't have to overwork the, uh, the, the RAM capacity of our computer to straighten out one, especially if we're using live camera and live video. And from there, uh, this is a very simple setup. Another stand, star analyzer, a Canon uh, camera. I use my oldest, oldest, oldest DSLR. That is an XSI, which is from the uh, Jurassic period of the SLRs, uh, a 58 millimeter um, adapter over on the right, because you can see in the circle, it says 58 millimeter um, diameter there. And uh, on the left, on the bottom, you can see my star analyzer. So from there, uh, here on the, on the uh, again, insisting on the point of keeping that straight out 
I, this kind of a wrong picture in the sense that I have it over on the left. I should have it over on the right. Uh, but it's the idea that you should keep it out on the right. Now, this is the, what I usually use here at my house. But when I'm doing outreach at the uh, Bernitzkis Club, I use the DSLR. Why do I use the DSLR? It's exactly the worst way to do it. But it has some saving qualities. One, because everybody has one. And where do they have it? It's in the closet. Because when, when they bought their uh, last smartphone, they said, why am I going to tug this around? It's too roomy. It's too bulky. And our philosophy here at the Copernicus Club is that we want to push people through the main entrance door, get them involved in spectroscopy without making a purchase. We do not want them to pull money out of their pocket. We want them to learn how to use what they got around in the closet, dusty. And uh, I have some basic guidelines here that will really help. It, it sounds really dumb, but I think you have to look at the ABCs here because I make these mistakes almost every time. Make sure you always have the right star. Use, like uh, Gary said a minute ago, use plate solving. <laughs> One day I had a, a, a public outing and I showed it over here, look for the brightest star on the West. It's gonna be Vega. It's the first one because look, 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 look. I, I, I saw it over here on the chart, and that's going to be it. And we saw the star, we tracked it. Then we, when we put it in the computer, and guess what? There was no, no big lines. There was no, no, nothing happened. I say, where did I go wrong? Well, I made a very good spectrum of Venus. I can't hear you, but I hope you're laughing. I enjoy laughing at myself. Uh, focus on the spectrum, not on the star. Do not overlook the, the uh, overload the pixel wells in your sensor and use live focus, connecting your camera with your laptop, using your camera as a webcam, which you might require an EOS uh, utility and get a good USB cable. So that's uh, this is in inside my uh, cabin here, and we uh, we have my artificial star up there over my chimney, and my camera looking at that star, and my camera connected to a uh, a, uh, a cable and connected to um, to our spec in the uh, laptop in live video. That is much handier. Next, try to use live camera video over there at the bottom you see, open and then use live camera. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Instead of like uh, Gary was saying, you know, don't take all your images and then go back and find it. Oops, it's all wrong. No, doing things in live mode, that's the wonderful and motivating thing, way of doing things. And another thing is try to make sure you're not overloading your pixel wells. So monitor flux per pixel, either with a 2D or 3D tool that you would have in RSpec and probably in other softwares. That's the one I use. So like when I see an image on the right there, well, maybe the overload there is not that bad because it's my uh, primary star because that, that's not going to be the one that's going to worry me. I, the primary star I needed to position how many iron strands, how many pixels I am away from the rest. But the other channels have to be way within, within let's say, uh, the 60 to 80% of your well capacity. You go over that and uh, the measurements lose significance. You do not get the, the, the uh, well depth and we do not see the differences of the different uh, wavelengths. Uh, finally, uh, this is another comment of Roberto. He said, the course of spectroscopy gave me a new way of looking at the stars, knowing what elements they're made of, 
the Harvard women were a key factor in developing this spectroscopy. And I really enjoyed getting to know the different stars and their types. Here we are at the uh, workshop, everyone with their, 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 um, their laptops, each one working. Here I am fiddling uh, uh, with the, with the um, star analyzer 100. They're trying it with different types of lenses, making experiments while they're analyzing and, and doing data reduction on our spec, each one of them. And uh, another one, Patricia said, I found the spectroscopy course to be very interesting, particularly because of the way the fields of science contribute to astronomy today, giving us a wider view. And uh, this is um, what I call spectroscopy outreach is a calling, a vocation. Nothing is more satisfying than sharing. Citizen science opens the door to scientific democracy. Science, citizen science doesn't only prepare us to participate in science. It allows us to question it and to come up with our own conclusions. Mankind, like the rest of the universe, is in a process of evolution. Scientific outreach allows us to contribute our part to improve our species. AVSO trains us in the art of citizen science. AVSO offers the best toolbox available for amateur spectroscopy. I strongly recommend our spec software, Star Analyzer 1 of diffraction grading, as an entry door into spectroscopy uh, and any type of uh, DSL camera. And I strongly recommend Richard Walker's uh, Spectral Atlas. Finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, AVSO for this invitation. I'd like to thank thank all the enthusiastic members of the Copernicus Club and for her unconditional support, my friend and fellow astronomer, Margot Galvan, our excellent conference volunteers at the club, Carlos Delgado, Artero Cantano, Marcos Winter, very prominent uh, archaeologist, Howard Banish from uh, Sky and Telescope, and uh, Emma Gardunia. For the priest in Augustinian, religious community at our Leo Chestachova Parish for our generous support. For his generous support, I would like to thank Tom Field from Field Tested Systems for his RSpect uh, software. Um, and for his support with all our computer issues, Tonatiu Hernandez, and above all, above all, for my patient and loving wife, Esther Gomez de Cavanaugh, and with that, um, please dream with me and do not be afraid to share your dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick, for that excellent presentation. All right, so we have had quite a lot of questions come in here. So um, we have questions for both of you guys. I'm going to start off actually <coughs> with one that came in uh, for Gary, because I think this one's relevant. And uh, uh, I saw that you answered it actually in the Q&A box, but I think everyone, including the people on Facebook, are uh, probably going to like to hear the answer. So uh, someone had asked if you could uh, share again how we get to your YouTube, where you've been posting on, on stuff like this photometry demonstration that you do. Ah, uh, yeah. So there's a there was a link in the presentation. Um, are it will this pres the video will be available shortly, right? It will, and I can okay. also uh, if if it's all right with you, I can also copy this over to the uh, comments on Facebook so that the people there can also access that. Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. And the the YouTube channel has got a number of videos, um, three primary areas: uh, EAA, which is an area that I was heavily involved with for a while. I've done quite a lot of live streaming with timeanddate.com for lunar eclipses. So there's some stuff up there. And more recently, there's how-to videos on the photometry side. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. And uh, let's see. 
So we had a question come in here asking, um, Gary, can you do useful photometry in urban areas such as in Phoenix, which is Bortal 6 or Bortal 7? Uh, or is it necessary to be under very dark skies or can you do it in the city? Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, and I'll, I'll answer another question that I saw in the Q&A at the same time. So okay. um, you can start your photometry journey anywhere. Um, I started in Bortle Eight Skies in San Diego, and it's surprising what you can achieve even in highly polluted light situations. Uh, you can also start into a point that Patrick made, and it's a message that I give to my AABSO students all the time. And it's why I continue to use the CMOS camera, and it's why I continue to use the CASCT, which is a pretty modest telescope. Um, you don't need to spend thousands and tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, yes, of course it helps, right? The best equipment is going to get you better results. But you would absolutely be amazed at what you can achieve with free software, the equipment that you have to hand, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of points to that. You can start out with an uncalled camera like a DSLR or an uncalled um, a one-shot color camera or mono camera. Um, I would eventually suggest you go to a cool camera, um, but you don't have to start that way. I mean, start with what you've got. And that's what I tell all my students, because at the end of the day, photometry is not for everybody. Um, a number of my students are not going to become photometrists, which is a shame. Um, but, you know, that's the way it is. Um, so don't go spending too much money until you need to. All you need to spend money on is the essential equipment to get you going. In my case, that was literally a UVIR cut filter. Um, in Patrick's case, I'm, he's kind of outlined the minimum equipment configuration you need for doing uh, spectroscopy. So um, don't worry about your sky conditions. Don't worry about your equipment. You can make most of it work at the beginning and then figure out where you're going after that. Great advice. Thank you. And uh, okay, so uh, piggybacking off of that, Patrick, we'll have a question for you in, in just one second. But there was one that seems highly relevant to what Gary was just talking about. And that was um, during your talk, Gary, Gregory Shanos had asked whether auto guiding is an absolute necessity. Uh, that seems like it's relevant to what you're just talking about. Um, I guess the quick answer to that question is no. Um, you're going to find with photometry the sort of ideal exposure times are sort of 30 seconds and up. Um, and the reason we tend to use 20 to 30 seconds is the minimum is that is because it, it averages out the atmospheric scintillation. And my daughter is either going to get in the picture and say hi to everybody or she's not. Right. Um, and so if you've got a tracking platform that will keep you stable for that period of time, which most platforms will do, uh, particularly if you're using a lightweight telescope, um, you don't need guiding. Um, when I'm doing photometry, I've got a guider on there. I mean, you know, my workflow gets me to start my guider up every time. So irrespective, I use guiding, but you don't need to. Um, and also, I think one of the questions was, can you do this with a Azel mount as opposed to a German equatorial? And the answer to that is yes, as well, you can. Excellent. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Patrick, we had a question come in asking, um, if the core of a main sequence star is creating a black body continuous spectrum, then why do we see absorption lines in stellar spectra? Well, I uh, honestly don't know how to answer that question, uh, first of all. Uh, but um, I do think what we're seeing there is not the light from the core of the sun. Uh, so uh, we don't uh, see that deep, as far as I understand, what, in, a, in a spectrum. Thanks. Do you mind if I add something to that? Please. Okay. The way that I once heard it explained, which made a lot of sense to me, was that you tend to see absorption lines when you look at something that's a light source through a cold gas, and the surface of the sun is made of gas that's way colder than the core. 
So that's why you get the discrete absorption lines. To me, that made sense. So maybe that'll help as well. Yes, makes a lot of sense to me too. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for helping explain that. Um, okay. So our next question here, uh, this one is directed at uh, at Gary. So uh, Yodra Siobhan was wondering, uh, why do some binary stars move in circular orbits while others move in elliptical orbits? Um, great question. Um, again, binary stars are not my strongest point. Um, they're, they're great targets to start your photometric journey with because they offer a large magnitude change and short period variations that are great for training yourself through that workflow process. And so that's why I started with eclipsing binaries and that's why I use them for photometry. Not really into this so much into the mechanics, but it's, it's basically orbital mechanics, right? Um, there are a lot of tools out there which will allow you to determine what the orbital paths are of the two stars that are rotating around a common gravitational center. Uh, if you've got questions about stellar flares, I can probably be a little bit more specific in my answers because <laughs> um, I do know a little bit more about that. And uh, we also have a, a couple of experts online as well, I believe. So, um, you know, we can certainly answer those questions for you, but it's I think it's orbital mechanics is, is the simple answer. Yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see. So another question for you. This one's about Astro Image J. Um, someone was curious if you could clarify whether Astro Image J does uh, bias, dark, and flat corrections in real time. Uh, and if so, how do you set that up in Astro Image J? Uh, yes, it does. It can do. Um, I've not done it or in the workflow that I use, I don't do it. Um, but if you go back to the, um, if I go back to this slide, I can screen share if you want, Lauren. Go ahead. Um, let me. Uh... Okay, so uh, hopefully I'm screen sharing. Yes. Yeah, there we screen. go. So here is your bias subtraction, dark subtraction, and flat field subtraction information. So if you uh, complete this and set the check boxes, as it goes through the processing, it will add uh, or do your dark frame, like uh, math, you know, uh, flat frame, bias frame correction for you. I actually do this in sharp cap on the fly. Um, so sharp cap will also do it. Um, and, and again, Again, I, I'm not a conventional photometrist. I, I tend to do things that seem to work for me sometimes. And I found that actually applying on the fly correction is better for me. You don't have to keep a record of what dark files and flat files are appropriate for a given set of data, et cetera, et cetera. I've found, you know, most people will say you should do this in post-processing or, you know, if we were doing it in real time. Uh, if you were doing it, you know, um, in, in post, you would, most people will do it in post as a separate thing. But I've never found an error that made me lose data by doing it on the fly. So I tend to do it on the fly with sharp cap. And when I'm doing the workflow for real-time photometry, the, the master darks and master flats are being applied by sharp cap to the raw image before it's dropped down to the folder. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Okay. Um, let's see. So this next question is directed at Patrick, and uh, it comes from Mizell Asnar Carbo, who's asking, uh, what CMOS camera would you want to use for uh, precision photometry? Uh, all of the cameras that this person's looking at have 12-bit uh, uh, sensors, and they're wondering if that would be an issue. And perhaps after uh, Patrick answers this, Gary, if you want to chime in, feel free since you're also uh, an expert on photometry as well. So Patrick, you want to go first? Well, uh, I, I would say, uh, uh, first of all, I would start out with uh, a 12 bit, but uh, I'm talking from a, a very uh, grassroots type of public 
that will be coming into the uh, spectroscopy community. Uh, right off, you probably want something a little bit um, more precise, but it always depends on the, the whole gear that we're looking at. In other words, what are what is the target we have in mind? If we're talking about magnitude two, we're talking about magnitude three, and we as we go up, but it seems like the excitement starts sometimes around uh, magnitude six, seven, eight, nine. And so we have to look at, uh, we have to look at the camera. We have to look at the, um, the, uh, the, the telescope. And then we have to make a decision if we're happy with a diffraction grading type of tool, or we want to go into something like uh, a slit type of spectroscopy. That, and I would imagine that when you go across that bridge into higher definition spectroscopy, you might make a step uh, towards a, a more um, a more strenuous type of uh, equipment. And uh, to tell you the truth, a lot of people follow your steps, Lauren, uh, on what you've been doing and where the way you've been growing. And uh, a lot of people that when we start talking about, it, they say, what does Lauren use? But uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that. And so okay. you uh, unofficially became sort of like a uh, spectroscopy role model in the community. Oh, uh, that's cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Maybe Gary can add something to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, going back to the point I made earlier, I think if anybody comes to me, I'm basically going to say to them, let's start with what you got. Mm -hmm. um and we'll you know as long we'll make whatever changes we need to to get good results out of that i mean maybe the equipment i i had a student come to me the other day and he kind of described my equipment and i'm like i just don't know how we're going to get this to work and uh, which wasn't the answer he was looking for um <laughs> but generally speaking i think you can start with almost anything i, I would say to now with CMOS technology where it is a 14-bit CMOS camera or up is probably the place to go that would be a cooled camera most people are if they really want to get into photo photometry are probably going to go a monochrome camera with photometric filters I'm going to stick with um TG I'm going to stick with tricolor and there's a couple of reasons for that one my students come to me with tricolor equipment so if I'm not using it then I, you know, there's a they're asking why. Um, secondly, actually, tricolor equipment can be used quite successfully. And with respect to stellar flares, which have an extremely rapid rise time, I can actually do tricolor measurements, which allow us to then determine effective temperature without sacrificing measurement cadence. Um, because if I am moving a filter wheel back between blue and uh, B and V or B, B and R, I'm sacrificing measurement cadence. Um, so there's the odd advantage of using tricolor, but the majority of people, if they get into this and, you know, they want to be producing results that can be directly compared with everybody else on the AABSO, they're going to go for probably a monochrome camera and Johnson and Cousins filters. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't use tricolor, submit tricolor results, do transformations, et cetera, et cetera. So, but going back to the camera question, I would say minimum 14 bit CMOS camera. Okay. Because they're relatively cheap now. I mean, compared to where they were, you know, 10 years ago when you were using C CD cameras, which were costing thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let's see. So next question here. Um, this one is directed at you, Gary. So can you use a DSLR together with Astro ImageJ? Yes. Um, 
you might need to use an additional piece of software, for instance, to get the, um, instead of using SharpCap, you might have to use something like Backyard um, Nikon or Backyard EOS, I think it's called. I think that's where I, when I was using my DSLR in the early days, that's what I was using. Um, but yes, uh, DSLR camera will work as well. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, a and I'll, I'll just add to that and kind of a bit to what Patrick said earlier. You're going to find there's a sweet spot with your, your equipment. Your equipment's going to be best suited to a certain group of magnitude stars. So like mine is really well suited to anything between about 10th and 13th magnitude. I can push it one way, I can push it the other way, but that's its sweet spot. And the other thing is, if you try doing really bright stars, unless you've got a wide field of view, finding comp stars is difficult. So you've got to, again, you know, kind of match your target to your comp stars, to their availability, et cetera, et cetera. But again, you know, don't try and figure all that out in the beginning. Um, work with what you've got and then figure out where you go from there. Thanks. All right, um, looks like our next question here is addressed towards Patrick. Uh, Gregory Shanos asked about the rings that step down from the uh, filter diameter of the 50 millimeter lens and step it down to a the size of a uh, inch and a quarter star analyzer so that you can actually attach it to the DSLR. Uh, Gregory's curious about that and maybe where you got yours and where he can get one as well. Okay, uh, well, what, what I did there is uh, on the uh, Tom Fields uh, um, website that is uh, rspec.com. And uh, I got, although he is like a reseller on some of the items, I believe because his uh, core business is the uh, spectroscopy hardware, which he has developed himself and which is really a uh, really sort of um, very user friendly for the general public uh, on the one hand. Uh, and um, now I have used at times what they call step up rings and step down rings, um, but uh, some, it's sometimes a little bit tricky and I it, it, they haven't worked out very well for me. So what I use is the very standard type of uh, uh, adapter of uh, this very standard stock 58 millimeter Canon um, lens to one and a quarter inch. And uh, otherwise, because I've ordered several step up and step down rings and never got it right. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay. And uh, next question. This one is directed at Gary. Um, and this was kind of uh, several questions. I think most of them have been addressed already, but um, uh, he was asking about the different types of cameras you can use, whether you can use a non-cooled camera. Um, do you have any comments on on that specifically? I know you said use what you've got. Um, would you would you be comfortable with one even if it doesn't have cooling on it? Yeah, I mean a non cooled camera is a is a, a good place to start. Um, you're gonna eventually move to a cooled camera, um, but again, you know, learn your trade before you start spending money. Good advice. I am a huge proponent of this. It's so easy. Mm -hmm. to uh, start just throwing money at this problem and um, often in, in totally the wrong direction. So um, I'm a huge proponent of uh, trying to use what you've got. Great advice. Thank you. Hey, um, Patrick, uh, we have a question asking how you do instrument response correction uh, on your spectra. If you have any particular resources, maybe, because I know it's kind of a complicated topic. So if you want to recommend any particular resources someone can read up on, I bet that would be particularly nice. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for helping me on the answer, because that, that is a, a complicated issue. I, I I completely avoided it in my uh, in my introductory course and even in, in the uh, in the, the, um, the workshop 
uh, and uh, now um, RSpec does have a series of um, tutorial videos and directly uh, at that uh, at the, aimed at that issue, and I would refer them to that because if I get into it, I'll probably do a, a mishmash of it, and uh, I think it would be better to their service to uh, look it up right there. And I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, RSpec is a great tool. I have a SA200 uh, grating um, that sometimes I'll take a look. The image calibration is is not particularly difficult. Um, the RSpec tool will walk you through it. Um, I was, um, I, I, my colleague Dave Decker uh, walked me through the process the first time and, uh, you know, it, it, it's not particularly difficult. It's, it's like anything, right? You just need to get used to the workflow. Once, once you understand the workflow, it's, it's good. Thank you. All right, we are almost through with the questions here. Uh, we have one more that came in on Facebook uh, from Phil Hops, who asked, um, for both spectroscopy and photometry, uh, what are you looking for specifically when you're going out to choose a new camera? Are you looking for a large pixel size, which would probably have a deeper well depth, uh, or would you prefer a small pixel size, which enhances resolution? Ah, this is kind of a tricky question. It kind of goes back to what Patrick was saying earlier on. You can't really consider the camera in isolation. You kind of need to look at the OTA and kind of, you know, use tools like the online field of view tool, Astro, whatever it is, which is really helpful. And, and then you have to look at what the light claim on the photometric side is, what the, um, the full, I've got to try and get this right, half maximum full width um, uh, results are going to be, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, it's just going through the process of trying to match the camera to the OTA. Again, you know, a bigger well depth is, is fine, but, you know, so that means to say you can either use longer exposures. If you haven't got a camera with a big well depth, then just use shorter exposures and do stacking um, before you, to create your image. I mean, taking an image of a 30 second exposure is you can mimic that by doing five second exposures and stacking six images, right? So, you know, you can you can get around a lot of the problems. You you do need to get the full width half. Ma um, I've got to try and get this right. Um, you got you do need to get the um, half maximum full width. Uh, is that right, Lauren? Full width half maximum. Yeah, there you go. You do need to get that at a minimum of two, and ideally no greater than four. So you're kind of um, you that will tailor um, the camera choice and in some way. All right. Patrick, did you want to add anything uh, on the spectroscopy specific side? Well, uh, I, I sort of like do it the easy way. Uh, there's a, there's a, there is a uh, camera calculator in there. Uh, I think uh, Tom Field has it on his uh, mm. RSpec uh, um, uh, website. And uh, I'm kind of lazy about it. I just put in, throw in the data. I think it asked me for the, uh, for my focal distance and, uh, and it asked me for uh, my uh, pixel width and pixel, uh, the pixel size. And uh, I don't remember three or four other, and I just push in there and there. And I think it's sort of like it puts green lights, yellow lights, <laughs> red lights, and if it's red, well, well, you you it's not going to work that well. So many times, what you do is uh, you say, "Oh, good! Instead of switching the camera, I'm going to switch the telescope," because a lot of us not only have a couple of cameras, we have a couple, couple of telescopes, and then, uh, or or maybe I'll use a focal reducer. So uh, you you start playing around with your uh, your variables, and uh, you always come up with something uh, laying around there. All right, great advice. That's good to know about that calculator. 
Okay, um, so I think our last question here is about choosing targets. So um, particularly keeping in mind the theme of outreach, you know, how do you choose a specific target that's good for, for example, a real-time photometry demonstration? How do you find out about that stuff? Um, well, I mean, you know, the AA VSO has obviously got the VSX database. Um, you want to pick from an outreach perspective, specifically a target that's got that's going to vary in a relatively short time frame. You know, I mean, you want to be able to see variations certainly within 30 minutes of starting, right? Because you've got a trend, you've got a group of people that's moving through all the time and not necessarily going to come back. If you can get the, um, the photometry run up and running ahead of the first people coming through, that obviously really good as well. Um, so an eclipsing variable is a perfect target. Many of them have, you know, six, seven, eight hour periods. Um, they've got a nice magnitude range, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's my target of choice. I mean, I wouldn't try and do a real-time photometry demonstration on a stellar flare, for instance, because you you could be, I've got so many flatline responses for six or seven hours worth of data that that is not the best choice. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think that that was our last question. Um, I see that uh, Brian is here and he's copying down some of the links that have been mentioned in the last couple answers into the chat. Thank you, Brian. So if anyone wants to get to the calculator, there's a link in the chat now. All right. I'm going to go ahead. And I'll, put up I'll just throw in one more comment uh, oh, just sure. because I like to be a little contentious at times. Um, and the question was asked, it was on the chat um, thing rather than in the Q&A. Um, so the question was, how will chat GPT affect astronomy or so forth and so on? Um, so chat GPT is one of my favorite topics at the moment. Uh, I've been working with it a lot recently. I was introduced to it about five months ago. It is, if you've not used it, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, it's amazing how this thing can go and collate information for you. It, it will write you code. It will give you references. It's super good at writing boilerplate documentation. I've just put a paper together that will be at the um, SAS 2023 conference in June on stellar flares. I used it extensively um, during the preparation of that. I would say it probably cut the paper preparation time in half. Um, incredibly powerful tool. You can ask it what targets to look at this evening. Uh, you can ask it for, like I say, references for basic information. Um, I think it's gonna have a huge effect on astronomy um, and obviously many, many other areas. So I just wanted to throw that in because for those of you who've not tried chat GPT in your, astro you know, in your astronomy uh, life, um, it's well worth looking up and, and seeing what it can do. Interesting. Thank you for I would sharing second that. that. I would second that, Gary. And uh, my background is uh, from, you're from right field and I'm from left field. Uh, I'm from, uh, I study philosophy. And I think the, uh, the implications in society, in education, are going to be a tidal wave. And I think uh, either we have to confront this and grab it and run with it and not resist it. And uh, I really uh, back what you're saying. It's just like the internet was 15 or 20 years ago. And the genie's out of the box on this one. Um, <laughs> so. It's incredible. It's just an incredible tool. I'm also a um, beta tester on the uh, Google Bard system, very similar. Um, and I just find it just such a useful tool for astronomy. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, try asking it a question. All right. Lauren, All right, thank what, you. what he's saying is that we have to invite him back for another uh, how to. <laughs> that talk in a couple of weeks and get them to <laughs> give us a talk on that topic hey that's not a bad idea 
<laughs> All right. Yeah, I might need six months. I'm not sure I can do it in a couple of weeks. You know, I mean, I would need a few months to get more data together. But uh, yeah, if you want some, it is it's fascinating. Great. Okay. Well, I'll I'll uh I'll reach out to you about that then. So okay. Thank you. All right. Um, let me go ahead and put up screen share of my own here. There we go. Okay. So, uh, as first and most important of our closing announcements, I would like to just extend a heartfelt thank you to both Gary and Patrick for sharing their time and knowledge with us today. This has been great. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, it's been it's been been a pleasure, Patrick. It was great to meet you and uh, uh, very interesting. It was kind of interesting how our presentations were very much different from each other. So very interesting. I really enjoyed it. Congratulations. Thank you all. All right. Uh, before we close out, I would also like to thank again our series sponsor, Boyce Astro. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please do check out their webpage to learn more about their work. I would also like to thank everyone who's here in the audience and joined in today. Your excellent questions really did help to make today's presentation and or today's session into something uh, quite special. And even more than that, it's your participation in all of our programs, which allows us to keep growing, keep educating, and keep making an impact on variable star science. So thank you, each of you. We're very grateful for your support. Today's broadcast has been recorded, and if you would like to go back and reference the recording, you can find it currently on our Facebook page. Uh, pretty soon, we're also going to add it to our YouTube channel, where it's going to join an enormous library of educational videos, which we've broadcast over the past several years. You can find our YouTube library by searching for the username AAVSOHQ. Okay, uh, one last announcement. When you log out of this webinar, you should be automatically shown a survey. I would really appreciate it if you could fill it out. Uh, let us know what you thought about today's session and what we could do better next time. All right, uh, looks like that's it. So to close, I would like to express one last huge thank you to both Gary and Patrick from all of us here at the AABSO. We appreciate you.